as well. My friends and I get to talk about very interesting topics week after week with our top-notch resource person. Be it educational and emotional, social and environmental, or health, the children's protection segment has got you covered. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. We're doing opposite words. Okay. Okay, so positive, negative, good, bad. <laughs> this is a feel of what goes on on the Get It Right segment. We get to teach you new words to enrich your vocabulary and to boost your confidence level. It even gets better, cause moi, the birthday queen, will get to celebrate your birthdays with you. Think you've had enough? We give you the vibe around the clock on the WhatsApp segment. Fill you in on all the gist and gossip in Ghana and beyond. And oh, we also get interactive with you, our lovely viewers at home, by reading messages sent to us on all the social media platforms. <laughs> AKA King Del. And once you see me on your screen, you know what time it is. So now I want you to get your dancing shoes on. We count it up by teaching you some new dance moves and to make you hip and trick. For Kids Paradise is at 2 p.m. this and every Saturday. And this is our world. Hi there, warm welcome back here on Prime Morning. It's time for us to get into the conversation of uh, lots of fever here on Prime Insight. And this morning, uh, in a month where we're celebrating a lot about Ghanaians and what we are, who we are, the things that makes us Ghanaians, it's also important that we turn our attention to the health aspect of our lives. And uh, for those of you out there, for the past weeks, I'm sure you've been hearing us talk about uh, the issue of lots of fever here on this very show. Now, the newspapers have been reporting and giving an updates on what exactly uh, the situation looks like. Uh, today, we want to turn our attention into making sure that we get to know exactly what it is, how we can uh, deal with it. And that's one of the things that you're supposed to be doing to make sure that you're preventing yourself from getting that, uh, uh, you know, disease that right now. Now, for uh, the benefit of uh, those of you who have not been able to know any update about it, one thing you should know for sure is that one person has died out of this. Like, one person has lost a life out of it. Now, the cases started off uh, very gradually, and then it's escalated into a numbering of 13. Now, we got into 14, and one person died uh, out of the 14. Now, don't forget that there are others who are also seriously uh, getting some treatment at various uh, hospitals, and uh, uh, we need to really uh, take this uh, very serious. Now, helping us do the conversation this morning here on the show, I've got Dr. Franklin Siudu, the, uh, the Queen. Uh, he's the Director of Public Health, Ghana Health uh, Service. He's going to help us understand what exactly this is all about and uh, what Ghanaians as a people are supposed to be doing to make sure that we do not uh, let it spread. And those of us who are also uh, have contact already, uh, what we can do to make sure that we don't uh, spread that disease. Doc, good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm doing good. How about okay. you? I'm very well. Thanks for asking. My name is KMJ. I'm grateful that you're able to join us this morning here on the show. Thank you. Great. So um, for those of us who are a bit, uh, um, you know, ignorant about it, if you like, um, lots of fever, lots of fever, what exactly are we looking at? Okay, um, thank you very much. So um, lots of fever, uh, so what we call lots of fever disease, is actually a disease caused by the Lassa virus. And uh, so at the early stages of the, the, the disease, um, the virus was found in a community in Nigeria called Lassa. So that's how it was called Lassa virus. And then you have the, the, the disease. It's a zoonotic uh, um, disease, meaning that the disease will start in an animal and then it will end up in man. So what happens is that the virus um, stays in um, um, a rat or a rodent which is called a mastomis. And then this mastomis, or this rat, will now uh, excrete the, the virus to its urine or its uh, feces or tropians. So when this, uh, when this uh, the urine or the tropians get onto your food, 
and then you ingest it, then you are, you are able to get the infection. So in that case, the virus has moved from, from has moved from the, the animal to man. So let's say um KM, your, your name is KMG. Eh? Yes, please. Okay, fine. So let me just use you an example. No problem. As you mean <laughs> as you mean the the the, the rats you eat um food contaminated with um the virus mm -hmm. you get you get an infection and then let's say as you mean you you have a wife or a girlfriend and then so when you get sick you start maybe passing um, um, vomiting or getting diarrhea so the wife will try to clean you up but so doing she also gets um, um exposed by the body fluids of you so then she will also get infected. So so the, if you look at the transmission, it's from man, you know, originally I said from the rats, that would have gotten to KMG, mm -hmm. and then it would have gotten to the, the girlfriend or the wife. So that's the way it moves. So it's from animal to man and man to man. It's actually um, presents with um, fever, in general body um, weakness, and the malaise. So we realize that early stages, it may be like malaria. So our first case that we, we lost, actually had that challenge, was seen in a facility, and they, they suspected malaria was managed, they went to and came back. So that's the early stage. We have that, that's, uh, look, that's the one who actually died? Yes, yes, yes. That was the one who had the very first case? Yes, that's the first case. Oh, okay. Because okay. That, so, so one thing which is clear is that it's not so easy to diagnose Lassa, because you need to suspect it. And because it's not very common, it, it will not come in, into your head. I mean, somebody has a fever, but the common one is malaria or something. Mm -hmm. So that's the first phase. Then later on, you may progress to have this headache, um, sore throat, um, um, difficulty in breathing. Some may even become unconscious. Mm -hmm. So this first case also went through um, that phase. And then the last stage is whereby the person starts bleeding from all openings. So from the inner region, from the vaginal region, from the mouth, all of you. So that's the end stage. If you are not lucky, you will die. So normally that period will take about 14 days. That's by the time you start getting symptoms to the end. So that's the way um, the, I'll say the cause of um, um, Lassa fever. But typically the incubation period is about two to 21 days. Meaning that if you are exposed to the virus, it will take between two days to change one day. Normally, it depends on the, the size of the inoculum, I mean, how much of the virus you have been exposed to. So that is it. But then the other issue I need to put across is that um, Lassa fever um, has um, a specific agent, uh, and there's an antiviral agent which is used to treat, but then we don't have a vaccine for it. So um, we cannot really prevent it unless you do your non-vaccine intervention. Okay, Doc, we're going to get into the, the, the nitty-gritty of it. I mean, um, if we're not able to really um, get help from this, then it means that it's, it's a serious thing that we have to be taking a look at. But one thing I want to find out, the, the first documented case happened as far back as 1969. And what happened? It went off and resurrected. Uh, how did we get here? Okay, so uh, let me see. The Ghana, the first case was actually confirmed in 2011. You know, it has been okay, as in, as in, in Ghana, yeah. But the very first one, the very first one occurred in, as far back as 1969 in Nigeria. Yes, so that's what I'm saying that last time is common in Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Benin. So, but one thing I need to state is that 80% of um, persons infected do not show any symptoms. Okay. So you have people yes who may be infected, but you don't show a symptom. So you may have the, the, the reservoir around you, and then you may be infected, but you don't show any symptom. So you know, being able to show symptoms varies depends on the person's immunity and things like that. Mm. So, so the Ghana situation, the first one was 2011. After that, we didn't seem to have anything. And then this one. So that's why it became a bit challenging to diagnose because it's not it's not very common. But then one thing that I think is, is good is that the Ghana laboratory system is, is good. Because if you don't have a good laboratory system, you cannot diagnose NASA. And it's possible you may die and you may assign other disease to it. So, so then, well, um, 
let's let's come back to the transmission again, uh, the, the the mode of transmission, uh, which of course you spoke about uh, the rats transferring that to the human, and then you also having a, a, a girlfriend. Now it's even difficult to know uh, because of the way it operates. It's extremely difficult to know if the person has it or not. So if somebody, for example, is having a normal fever, diarrhea, and all of that, uh, at what point does the person now decide that, you know what, this is just beyond the normal diarrhea I'm having. It's just beyond the normal fever I'm having. So I need to be testing for uh, something like loss of fever. So what we did was that initially, you know, we released uh, two documents. One was uh, an alert. So targeted at the health workers. We gave them like a case definition. So it was supposed to guide the clinician about what to look for and then how to prompt them to look for LASA. But typically, we see that somebody who has a LASA, they will not be responding to the common antiviral, um, antibacterial, and then also the anti -malaria. So you may have a case comes to you as a fever, you give anti malaria treatment, it's not doing well, you give some anti but it's not doing well. Then that case, the issue is what is happening to this guy. So it will prompt you. Then also because uh, we are having case of last time, you need to be able to ask more. I mean, try to probe uh, from the from the patient what could have been the, the factors, uh, whether he also been exposed, whether he has some rats in, in the in the house. So those are things that will guide the clinician to suspect uh, whether the case will be last time. Because as I said, you can't straight away just say this is last time, uh, unless you suspect and send samples to the, the lab. Let's look at the um, the risk involved and how much of uh, importance we've attached to this. Uh, the cases keep increasing. Uh, as of now, I don't know how many we have, but I mean, like we, 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 it, it was reported 13, 14, and one has died. So we're looking at around 13. There's been some contact tracing as well. How, how is that also going because of the risk involved in this? Yes, yeah, so um, I think that we need to... Um, it's likely by the end of, um, and on this one, you're going to get an update. The case will go up. You see, what is happening is that, and, and we need to explain this clearly. So we have the first case, who we'll, we will call the index case. And then that case somehow infected somebody who was a contact. So now we have two cases. These two cases will not generate contacts. So there are persons who have had direct contact or have been exposed to the, um, let's say, the clothing of um, of these persons. So they are contacts. Normally what you do is that you follow them up to the maximum commission period, which is 21 days. So, so far, all the 14 cases that we have gotten are contacts of the early cases. So what is good for us is that we have not been able to get a case which is outside of what we call this cohort. So all of these cases can be traced to either the first case or second case. So what we are doing now is to be able to mop up all contacts so that you can be able to follow them. And then immediately they show symptoms. You see that you have become a case and then you isolate them. And that one cuts off um, the, the degree of um, contamination in the in the system. So for now that's what we are doing. Our teams are on the on the on the field trying to get all contacts and then they, they actually were well, uh, monitored so that we don't cross our 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 I would say our net to bring in a, a, a new set of um, um, cases. It's still on the risk of exposure. Le let me find out in terms of age, is it a respect of age? Um in, in terms of infection, are kids vulnerable as well? No, I think that the, whether you are old or young, or whether you're male or female, it doesn't really matter. The issue is that whether you are exposed to the virus. I mean, people have their own uh, inherent um, um, defense mechanism. So it's not everybody who will be exposed who, who becomes symptomatic. As, as I told you, 80% of the people who have the infection do not show any symptoms at all. So um, what we need to do is to try and prevent contact um, with, the, with the animal. Because as see, it could be very simple. I mean, as I said, let's say you have your kitchen. You have some mango that you left it overnight. You are not sure what happens. In the night, this rat comes, um, urinates on the mango and goes, goes back. The next morning you get up, you think you have a mango. You go, you don't even wash it. You eat it, so it could be a source of infection. So the main issue is about how are we managing 
your environment within your house and outside of it. Because the more the more it, it, it breeds um, the right environment, then the rats um, get um, attracted to your house, and these are small small rats. So that's why if you look at our first um, release, we talked about some instances that people have to bring in um, cats uh, to the house to to wear away this um, this um, um, rats. So the other issue is um, what we want to push across is that. It's not every fever which is malaria. So don't assume that you have a fever you want to treat on your own. It could be lesser. So if you go to a hospital, the doctor listen to you and say, okay, let me check whether it's lesser. So then that is one thing that we also want to put across. If you have a relative who is, who is ill, we are not encouraging you to say you want to manage it at home. Because when you are exposed to the secretions, body fluids, and blood, you may get infected. The, the, the aspect of um, transmission, um, it, does it have to do with sexual um, uh, intercourse as well? Does, does it go through that processes or it's just maybe the fluids coming from the person's body, maybe the nose or the eyes that when you come in contact with? No, there, there's, some, there, there's some element of documentation that um, some cases have reported um, last uh, through sexual, sexual uh, Intercourse, so there's that element of um, risk because it's about also a stage of influence. But normally, when you, you, are, you, are, you are sick, <laughs> you need to think about yourself if you want to <laughs> enjoy sex at that time. Then I don't know. But then there's a risk that you can also have um, sexual. Uh, no, you can also get lasa following um, sexual intercourse. It's documented, but though it's on the lower side. So, uh, in, in terms of the records that you had um, from all the uh, 13, if you like, because now we've, we've lost one person out of it. So, from all the 13 uh, which has been recorded, uh, where, where is the risk more in terms of our regions? Uh, is it here in Accra or in Kumase or in Cape Coast? Where, 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 where are we having the, the most risk people? No, so um, for now, the cases are all in Accra. So, they are, they are all... Uh, contacts by way of relatives, by way of friends, or by way of health workers who manage the cases. So, but let me say that um, Central Region has also uh, we've gotten like what I call a probable case in Central Region, but it's not related to this one. So it's been, it's been investigated to see what is it that um, for now there's no linkage of any um, cases moving from Accra to Accra Region. Let's look at the, the, the death rate. Now, as, at what point is, is it too late for somebody to survive from uh, Lassa, Lassa fever? So, um, first, um, you know, this, uh, the one that died, you know, it went through a whole cycle for about two weeks. And then, let's say, assuming um, it was suspected early, uh, let me say we are thankful to WHO. They brought us uh, over 100 vials of the antiviral agents. As I was telling you, we, there's, a, there's, there's treatment for Lassa. There's no vaccination. There's treatment. So if you go to hospital early, there, 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 are, there, are, there are clear medications that can be used to, to manage you. So what is important is being able to be confirmed early and being started on treatment. So if you look at the literature, they talk about the case fatality of about 1%. But I know that it, it has to do with how soon you go to a hospital. So if you go to look at the Colibu case, it got there, it died within five hours because it had moved round, round, round for about two weeks. So in that case, you are not likely to get the best outcome. But as even if it had gone to the hospital quite early and they knew it was last, I'm sure we didn't have had this unfortunate death. Okay, so the issue of um, what to avoid to uh, uh, be sure you're not contacting uh, uh, Lots of fever. Uh, if it comes to those who are ch doing chewing bush meats and and all of that, you know, people who always want to chew uh, or <laughs> patronize be like, you know, bush meat and all of that, uh, are, are they also at risk? Okay, so normally I would say that you see what is happening is there's all the eating of the bush meat. Okay, is the preparation, is the preparation of it because I talking about this exposure mm. to the secretion. And then the blood. So let's say if me, a shade of green, I prepare bush meat for you, it can be easy. You are not at risk. Me, I'm the one who is at risk because I'm the one who's going to be exposed to the blood and secretions. 
Do you understand? So um, what we say is that preparations of uh, of bush meat, it might be avoided. I mean, so if I don't prepare, why are you going to eat it? Do you understand? So that's the, that's the, that's the message. So it's not that eating it is a problem. It's the preparation of it which is a problem. In the process of the preparation, um, I don't know how strong it is in terms of the virus itself, but in the process of the preparation, if it comes into contact uh, with heat, does it not in any way uh, lessen the potency of the virus or even kill it totally? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. That, but then see the guy, the guy who cut it, open it, he's the one being exposed. So I say, if if I say if he finish it, and somebody is now doing kebab with it, that was a different thing. But the one preparing it, but I don't see people preparing that thing with wearing gloves or whatever. So they are, their hands is dry hands, bare hands, and they are being you are being exposed to the blood, the secretions of the animal. So as you as you so doing, you get infected, you get a disease, you can infect others. So as you mean you finish, and then it's well hit, then number one, the risk is minimal. But it's a preparation which is a risk. In your earlier statement, you mentioned that there's, there's there's no vaccine for it, but there's treatment. It means that, and you also used the word manage. Now, does it mean that when you have that disease, you can't be cured totally, or you can just be managed, uh, you know, and be treated, but then you still have to live with it, just like maybe HIV? No, 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 as I said, there's, a, there's, a, there's an antiviral agent, Ibabel, which can be used to treat. So the, what is most important is how soon you go to a hospital. Because if you go quite late, then you are not likely to get the best outcome. But if you go early, you can be treated. So it's a, all like maybe other um, conditions that they does not have a specific antiviral agent. This one has it and it's being used. And we have we have some um, in, the, in, the, in the system. Okay, so let, let's let's take a look at the. And, and the, let me also say something. The, you know, we have this is thirteen cases, mm -hmm. but they are not ill. You know, so they are they are fine. I mean, typically most of the viral um, this have, um, last of fever cases are, are mild. It's only few that um, will have severe form of the disease. So that's one thing I want to put. Uh, so all the all the thirteen people are fine now. Yes, 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 yes. They are fine. So I'm um, sure very soon we will be the start. Now let's look at the other aspect of it: the health uh, professionals that are taking care of these uh, patients. Uh, have we protected them well enough in terms of what they are supposed to use in treating these patients? Yes. Yeah, so um, the idea is um, in the hospital environment. There are a lot of risks, so we we, we do what we want. Infection prevention and control. So the assumption is that every patient can be a source of infection. So what is needed is a PPEs. And uh, thankfully, I don't think we have a shortage of PPEs. The effort is being made to get more PPEs. So make sure that you are well down, your eyes, your, your nose, mouth, your body is covered. So those are the PPEs. And uh, I think that now that it's clear that we have a LASA, it's going to be more, uh, people are going to be more conscious to be sure they are fully prepared. I mean, assuming I see you coming to see me and have some love, so see you only came there. Yeah, came there. Before, so I would, I would be before I realize I've lost on guard. But now that it's last time, there's no need to lose any guard. You need to be well protected, well clothed to manage any any case. In the case of we trying to manage it here in Ghana. What are we also doing in terms of from the um, Ghana Health Service point of view, uh, as in, in, in connection with those who are also coming out of the country? Now, we, we understand that people in uh, Nigeria, uh, Sierra Leone, and all these places, Guinea, uh, all these places are having the same um, situation. Now, in terms of those coming in, what have we done to ensure that uh, whilst we are trying as much as possible to manage it here and we are eradicating it uh, gradually, we don't have other people coming in and bringing it to us again? Yeah, so we have uh, oriented our, our portal staff. So they do a, a, some kind of screening at the point of entry. So that they say if you are coming in and you are, you are, you are, you are sick, you will be determined at the point of entry and we will take the decision measures. So that's what we, 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 are, we are doing at our point of entry. Is there an um, issue of maybe um, the person has to be taken to the hospital in terms of um, 
making sure that the, whoever that is coming and whoever that has it is put into a, a certain facility for a while, quarantine if you want, uh, before we are able to, or we just check the person. If the person has it, we direct the person, okay, go for medication here, and then that's it. Because of the period that it takes for you to even notice. No. Yeah, so, so if a person is asymptomatic, uh -huh. then you, have, you, you cannot find it. I mean, if the person is coming to your country, is not ill, so what is the problem? If the person has symptoms, then the, it will be detected at the point of entry, and then we refer to a nearest health facility. That is the protocol. Okay, uh, so it, mean, it means that uh, we, we, we have some facilities, selected facilities, if you like, uh, that these people can be taken there. That is the person is showing symptoms. Yes, yes. It's not all over, but what they do is that every point of entry has an identifiable uh, referral point. Okay. And uh, let me say that um, some of the point of entries have um, ambulances. Okay. So it's called, and then you are referred. I won't say it's all, but that is, I mean, let me see, we are thankful to some of our partners, JICA, IOM. They are helping us to beef the capacity at the point of entries. So if you, if you detect a case like that at the point of entry, that you refer to a nurse um, um, health uh, facility. Very well. Uh, let me try and invite our viewers uh, in the conversation a bit. Now, if you just join us here on the show, this is Prime Inside. We're talking about Lassa fever, uh, that which has claimed one life already. 13 uh, were also, uh, you know, infected. But the good thing is that they are all being taken care of uh, and uh, free of it. Uh, it's, a, it's a dangerous disease if you're looking at it from face value. You probably should be a bit more worried about it. But Dr. Uh, Franklin Esiodube Queen has been helping us understand what exactly it is and what we can do to prevent the situation of Lassa fever. He's the director of uh, public health, uh, Ghana Health Service, and he's on Zoom uh, explaining things to us. But you can also join us on the show and uh, you can give us a call if you have any question you want to ask if uh, you've come into contact or you have sitting uh, fever, uh, diarrhea, whatever it is, and you're a bit worried and uh, you want to get clarity on what exactly is wrong with you, uh, Doc is going to be here to help us with that uh, conversation as well. So you can give us a call and let's uh, talk about it. If you've heard about it in any of your areas and uh, you're also a bit confused what exactly this is all about, uh, we've been trying to, you know, get some education on that. So you can also ask your questions, uh, and I'm sure Doc would uh, answer them for you. If you're on WhatsApp, you can send your messages on our WhatsApp line. It's very active as well, and you can ask your questions there on uh, social media. It's Joy Prime TV on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter. Those are places you can also uh, drop your messages uh, and let us know what you think about uh, Lassa fever. Uh, wherever you're calling us from or you're testing us from, uh, just let us know about it. If you have a heart about cases, uh, you know, uh, in that region as well, you can let us know so that uh, uh, maybe Doc would also take it from there. All right, Doc, um, le le let's, let's look at... Um, the issue of totally eradication. Now, is it possible that we can get to a point where we would in, the, in two years or three years or even more, we will not have this Lassa fever uh, getting uh, into our system or we even having cases at all? You know, I mean, and that is very difficult because we don't have an idea of the population of the rats in the, in the system. Mm. So it, you know, it's not about human beings, it's about rats. And they are living their life in giving birth. So the issue is the population you don't have control over. What we have control over is preventing them from entering our households. So that's what we can we can we can do. But we cannot say that. So far as the, the, the reservoir is there, the virus is inside the reservoir. So if you, you open yourself up, you get infected. Okay. So maybe, unless maybe we also have a vaccine. In that case, you can say that oh, who are prevented from getting the, the disease. Now, the issue of the vaccine, why don't we have it? Are there possibilities that we may have it? Or it's something that we should even be having a conversation around, or we should just prevent ourselves and that's it? I think that the vaccine development is, uh, is a big thing. I mean, and at times, it also depends on the... It has its own economics, you know? Okay. I mean, Lassa, Lassa is not a big deal. I mean, just some small disease, some, some very small countries. So as you mean, last time you get all over the world, people will invest more into the vaccine development and get the vaccine. So for now, 
it's, uh, I'll say it's a lot of work is being done, but we, are, we don't have the vaccine now. Okay. Now, before we wrap it all up, let me ask this question. So, for example, if there's a rat in my house, I've opened a barrel uh, full of water, and the rat actually gets into the water, and I fetch the water I drink, or any other person fetch the water and drinks it. Um, what's that scenario? I ha the person has it already, or it's possible? Yeah, that's the assumption. Yeah, he has it and falls into the water and probably dies. And um, the person does not see. Maybe it goes down into the barrel. The person does not see it, fetch the water, and then drinks it. What's, what's that case? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you, are, you are actually going to ingest some of the virus into you. So wow, um, you, are, you are at a risk. But so I think that's why we need to now be a bit more protective of our, of our what we be taking. Wow. Uh, we need to know our our environment and see how best. We don't need to just leave everything to chance. Do you understand? Uh, they're assuming that everything is fine because by the time you get up in the morning, the rats are not there. They've gone, so we don't know what they've actually done to you, your your. Your environment and i think that we need to protect our environment as much as possible okay uh, any other thing you want us to know moving forward before we say goodbye to you in terms of uh, lassa fever okay so what i will say is that um, we may get more cases in no cases we may get more contacts and uh, what it actually means is that um uh, but let me make some clarity here Mm. If the cases are from the contacts, then it's not a bad situation. Okay. Because there's been an exposure long before, and then the body is gradually working on it out. So it's not a new thing. Like if you look at the first case, I think first case died, I think on the 17th or something like that. So let's say if you were a relative and you were caring for that person, you have been exposed. So we are we are just contact tracing you. So we are just waiting for to see what will happen. You understand? So that way there's nothing new. The only the new thing is that when we get a new case, who is not somehow related to this set of cases, then we, we get worried. In that case, there's a kind of spread of the of the virus in the in the community. So um I want us to um take caution how we interpret. The figures. So as we come tomorrow and say we are 20, you know, we have 110 K um, contacts. Yes, because we are doing contact tracing, we want to be able to sure that we have all contacts um, so that we can monitor. If we have, uh, let's say, uh, now we have 14 cases minus one, the one who died. Let's say we go and we have um, um, the 20. The issue is that the 20, were we able to immediately identify them and isolate them? Mm. It, if we done, then that case is still being contained outbreak. So that's what we are trying to do as a health system. Until we go to the end of the incubation period, which is one days, you can say that we followed all our contacts. Ten have become cases. They are being man they are being managed in the hospital. The rest have been um, followed through. They are not showing any signs. They are in the start. Then we are getting close to the end of the situation. And I think that's what we want to put clarity um, over the situation. Okay. Uh, many thanks to you, Doc, for joining us this morning. We appreciate you. We're grateful that you were able to spend time with us this morning here on Prime Insight. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Sure, you do same. And that's uh, Dr. Franklin Sierubekwe. He is the Director of Public Health, Ghana Health Service, spending time with us this morning and helping us understand what exactly Lassa Fida is all about and what we can do to make sure that uh, we're taking very good care of ourselves all right so i'm sure at, at least now you have some clarity and you definitely want to take care of yourself in terms of uh what lesser fever can actually do to you now moving on we've got our conversation on relationship coming up and today we're taking a look at marriage list in ghana uh focus uh, will be on akan and ever tribes and to help us do the conversation this morning uh, we've got uh, uh here in the studio with us uh, 
uh, evangelist. Uh, uh, we have uh, Reverend Mrs. Uh, uh, Jennifer Selly. Uh, she's a marriage counselor uh, coming all the way from Petra International Church. Uh, she's going to be one of uh, our guests here in the studio. And my own papa is going to be here. Reverend uh, Daniel Annan is uh, a counselor and uh, a preacher. I mean, this man you love to listen to. All right. So uh, those of you who have uh, encountered him, <laughs> you, you know exactly what, we're, what I'm talking about. But uh, Reverend and uh, uh, Reverend Mrs. Sally are all in here in the studio. So let's take a look at it. It's the Ghana month and all our conversations will be around uh, Ghana and uh, what we stand for as a people. So please do enjoy. I see you the golden girl will be taking that conversation up right here on the show. Please do stay. We're back with some more here on Prime Morning. We bring to you the story of the first female pilot in Ghana and the first female pilot in the whole of West Africa. Her name, Melody Millicent Dankwa. Melody Millicent Dankwa was born on 6th January 1937. Her father's name was Ibinija Rexford Addo Dankwa. Her father was a court registrar and an arbitrator in Ghana. Her mother was Selina Gyamfi. Her parents had a total of 10 children and Melody was the sixth child. Melody grew up under the care and guidance of her parents. And when she became of age, she was enrolled in elementary school. She was educated at the Methodist primary and middle schools in Latte, and also educated at the Wesley Girls High School in Cape Coast. She also attended the government secretarial school. In Ghana. In 1963, the then president of Ghana, President Kwame Nkrumah requested that women should be recruited into the Ghana Air Force. Following the president's request, a newspaper advertorial was published by the Ghana Air Force. A couple of women applied, but few were chosen. Millicent was one of the few that was chosen. She was chosen among the first three women to be trained into the Ghana Air Force as pilots. Millicent performed creditably in training to the admiration of her flight instructors. She made the grades in all her courses. She later attended the Ghana Military Academy for basic military training, a prerequisite for pilots. She was found worthy by her instructors to move the plane and go solo into the skies and on 22nd June 1964, flight cadets Melody Millicent Dankwa flew solo for the first time in an aircraft and thus broke the record as the first female Ghanaian to fly an aeroplane solo. She arrived at her destination and landed safely. From then on, she flew severally to the admiration of many. She received her wings on April 15, 1965, recognizing her as a fully trained pilot. This was presented to her by Kofi Baka, who was the Minister of Defense in Ghana at the time. Millicent became an instant inspiration for thousands of women in Africa and a symbol of pride to the government of Ghana. Millicent had several flights to her record and in June 1968 she ended her flight career and began to do administrative work in the Ghana Air Force. In 1984 she was discharged from the Air Force due to the state of her health at the time and following her request in that regard. She received a long service award and the efficiency medal in recognition of her services to Ghana. Following her retirement from the military, she worked for the World Food Program for a brief period 
and then with the National Service Secretary. Millicent was a deeply religious person and at the age of 60, she earned a diploma in Bible studies and theology and began to preach to military audiences in her home country of Ghana. She later joined the board of directors for the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration. In 2006, she was honored with the award of the Companion of the Order of the Volta by President John Kufo for being a courageous pest setter from Ghana. Millicent died on 16th March 2000.